so good afternoon and welcome. Uh, Chris, thanks for that introduction. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, like Chris and actually uh, like the person who helped us score up here. This is always my favorite uh, event and panel of the conference and so it's really a privilege to be hosting it today. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists briefly and then I'll actually ask them to introduce themselves so that you get a sense of the depth, breadth, and expertise that we have that we'll be sampling from today. I think it was mentioned, but please also make sure that you send questions to me throughout the course of this panel so that I can incorporate those uh, into the Q&A session as we go. So first, actually, and most directly here to my left, I have uh, Mike Nohaley. He is a PhD in SVP of Strategy and Commercialization and Innovation at Amgen. Next beside him, I have Adam Koppel, who's also a PhD, a little heavy on the uh, grad degrees here this, the, today. Um, uh, and uh, Adam is a managing director of Bain Capital Life Sciences. To his left, I have Jim Sinclair, who's the managing director of the healthcare group at Goldman Sachs. After that is Krishna Yashwant, uh, who is an MD and also a partner at Google Ventures, an instructor in medicine actually at one of our hospitals at the Brigham. And then uh, back, beyond Krishna, I have Amir Nishant, also a PhD, uh, and, uh, uh, excuse me, a uh, managing partner at Polaris uh, Venture Partners. And then finally, uh, last but not least, um, and uh, uh, my boss in the interest of full disclosure, <laughs> uh, Roger Kidman, who's our VP of Venture and then managing partner at Partners Innovation Fund um, here at the Partners Healthcare System. So thank you all for joining. I'm actually now gonna put it back to you guys to actually just briefly give you a little bit more of bio and intro of yourself and a little bit of a framework of what you do in your organization, particularly as it relates to AI and technology. So, uh, Mike, if I could have you tee that up. Sure. So, uh, I work at Amgen, which is a large biotechnology company. I think everybody knows. And so, we're interested in artificial intelligence as it can make us more effective and efficient in what we do, how it can help us touch our patients better. And so we see a bright future for it, and my role is to help make that happen and lead our efforts in that area. Uh, Adam Koppel, I uh, work at Bain Capital, and within Bain, uh, part of a fund that's dedicated to uh, growth equity investing in the life sciences, and I think that AI is one of the, you know, one of the key emerging uh, uh, changes that we're seeing uh, in the investment space in life sciences. It's both critical for much of what all the companies we do, how they get done what they get done, how they create value, and of course the newer thing is looking at companies that make it their, their business model uh, to advance and, and use uh, AI for uh, as their business. Jim Sinclair, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs offers advice around uh, on the investment banking side, helping companies uh, complete uh, mergers and acquisitions, and then both raise debt and equity financing. Within the Goldman uh, investment banking franchise, I cover companies in the healthcare technology side and healthcare services, and so the perspective that we'll bring is more uh, as companies mature and grow, what are their public market prospects, what are the demand um, from the uh, incumbent companies on both the uh, healthcare and technology side. My name is Krishna Yeshwant. I work at Google Ventures. Uh, we're the venture fund of Google, <laughs> surprise. Uh, we uh, invest across all stages of companies, uh, primarily focusing on earlier stage companies. Uh, as far as it relates to healthcare, because we invest across all sorts of companies, uh, we go across the spectrum of therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, med device, payer provider. Uh, and as it relates to AI, we, we really actually focus on trying to make great businesses in each of those areas or areas uh, between those uh, various uh, uh, subcategories of the industry and then look for ways that machine learning might be enabling uh, in some fundamental way. Uh, my name is Amir Nishat. Uh, at Polaris, I'm a managing partner. We've, for the last 20 plus years, invested in healthcare broadly and technology uh, broadly. And over the and so our healthcare investments have included what you would call you know healthcare information technology in the old days and now is called machine learning I suppose um, and so the two parts of our business of investing in kind of mo modern approaches to information and informatics started in non healthcare areas and we've invested in many machine learning companies related to security and e-commerce and other things and increasingly is now moving over towards what the healthcare group traditionally uh, did as well. So we're getting a lot of investments now and interest uh, at the interface. 
Um, so I'm Roger Kitterman. I'm the managing partner of the Innovation Fund at Partners Healthcare. So in addition to hiring really good people, um, my role is to, uh, what we do is look at technologies that are coming out of the partner system. So new things that are developed at our hospitals, in a lab, um, on the IT side, on the, on the enterprise side, and invest in spinning those out into companies. Um, we do therapeutics, diagnostics, um, medical devices, and a, also a focus on healthcare IT as well. We've done a few deals in that area. Yeah. So, so thank you all, and I think, again, that speaks to the depth and breadth of, um, of the panelists that we have today. So I'd like to do two things with the panel today. One, I'm going to ask you guys to sort of be a little visionary and a little predictive and ask you to sort of think through into the future, but then I'm also going to ask you questions about how you actually reduce that to practice in the present. And one of the reasons I think that that's an important aspect to, uh, to, to touch on today when it comes to um, you know, AI writ large is that there's a lot of promise and there's a lot of things that we keep predicting are going to to happen, and part of what we have to ask ourselves as investors is when is the timing right, and when do we actually convert? When does something mature enough, and also where do we want to place those investment dollars? And so those are the types of things that I'd love to have you guys comment on as we go throughout, and then obviously some very specific questions based on the way that you practice and, and the expertise that you have. But I'll start with that big picture question, and I will actually have this one just go down the line, and um, you know, as you can imagine, if someone starts to run too long, I'll try to make sure everybody gets to... Uh, uh, to, to speak to it, but within the next five to ten years, where would you put a dollar today? So within that, so not today, actually investing, but within the next next five to ten years, where would you put that dollar? So anyone want to start, or else I'll just start to pick people <laughs> at random. Yeah. All right, I'll start. Left to the dealer. Um, <laughs> no. So I think the the couple of areas that I'm the most excited about are. The ability to use real world evidence to really figure out what's going on. These are very large data sets, very complicated. And the suite of techniques that loosely go under the AI label are very helpful for those and I think are going to make a big difference in really helping us understand what works in the healthcare system and doesn't. We're also quite excited about the ability to use these technologies to speed drugs to market. To, to improve development, make it faster and better. And then lastly, I'd say um, the commercial applications, the direct commercial applications to, uh, you know, it's the old joke that half my marketing spend is wasted, I don't know which half. Uh, you know, we think these technologies are really helping us understand that much better. Great. Right. So, you know, I think our focus in investing is really identifying uh, the drugs, the therapies, the diagnostics, uh, medical devices, all the elements that are needed to help uh, physicians treat their patients better, more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, so for us, uh, at least in the near term, and I consider five years the, the vision in the near term, we're looking for some of the tools that better enable that. But ultimately, investment decision at this point is really, I think, agree with what Mike said, is getting those products to market. But the tools that can better aid um, companies in doing that are very helpful. So whereas the near term focus is more on the use of these new technologies to better enable that, there is also, I guess, the concept of investing in companies companies whose business it is just to help all the other pharmaceutical and medical device companies do that better. So I think there is a mix. I'd say for us at, at this point, we are more focused on um, the first part, the companies that are leveraging these tools to better enable them and more efficiently enable them to bring drugs and medical devices to market. But I do think we are st now starting also to look at the distinctive players that are providing those, those tools and services to the market. Um, so I'll give you one cross theme um, where look, I think there's been enormous amount of capital put to work uh, in pursuit of um, you know, AI potential in the clinical diagnostic side. Um, and certainly, uh, I think, in furthering some of the earlier comments around uh, drug discovery and therapeutic advances. Um, when I look across the non-therapeutic side of healthcare, I actually think there's under investment or underrepresentation of companies that can just help um, you know do the basic building blocks paying a claim uh, rejecting a claim um, answering benefits questions from from people to understand uh, you know what what what's happening and, and that's where I actually think um, there's a real demand real you know very demonstrable ROIs and uh, a bit of uh, underrepresentation of investment dollars in that in those areas. So um, 
most, most of the places that I find myself getting excited about investing, and I think I'll likely stay in this place unless something material changes over the next few years, um, really is not around specifically machine learning or AI. You know, and, and to some degree, I'm biased because we sit you know, relative to Alphabet and Google where we have this tremendous machine learning apparatus. Um, most, most of the challenges we see in the area um, uh, from where I sit uh, are actually just a lack of data, a lack of high quality data, a lack of sufficient volume of data. Uh, and, and so, you know, maybe it goes back to Mike's point of, you know, real world evidence. And, and, and to me, at least, you know, if I, if I, you know, open the aperture on that, uh, I might call it, you know, um, a learning health system or something of that genre where, you know, we, we're all as clinicians out there uh, producing data every day as, as a byproduct of seeing patients. Uh, we're doing that as a health system, as a byproduct of, uh, of transacting with the payer and, and kind of across vendors and whatnot. Most of that data in most systems is not particularly organized, it's not particularly clean. Uh, you know, if you were to apply a lot of the machine learning uh, algorithms today, uh, you might get biased answers um, because, because they're, it's, it's, it's maybe in, incorrectly represented as to what's really happening on the ground. And so most of the opportunity I think right now in machine learning is not necessarily new machine learning, uh, but actually just cleaner access to larger amounts of data. And, and a lot of times that ends up looking like um, uh, new services, uh, new products uh, that are designed with that at least somewhere in the back of one's mind, uh, or a redesign of existing services with that in the back of what one's mind, because, um, because once we get that data set uh, for any of the different sorts of problems that we want to solve, uh, you know, you, you can actually start to see how the machine learning fits into uh, solving an actual problem as opposed to just machine learning for the sake of machine learning, which is, I think, as an investor, the vast majority of what I see come in the door. Um, but when I think proactively of where we're excited and where we're spending most of our time, it's much more around where's the data coming from, why is this the data that we're interested in, and then, and then how does it organically fit into the workflow of the various parts of the ecosystem that we're uh, talking to. Yeah, um, I, so, I, I think at Polaris, we kind of try to keep it simple in the healthcare group, which is most of our investments um, are either how do we make sure the patient gets the very best therapy that they should, they can get, um, so really on the service side and decision support um, and diagnostic side, and then inventing, you know, en enabling entrepreneurs to invent therapies for cases where patients don't have solutions, and that's maybe the more the biotech side. And I think I, with regards to, uh, Christian's comments, I completely agree that on the former side, there's just the data sets by which decisions are made today are very hard to kind of, they're just kind of messy data sets. Um, and the investments we have been making and I think we'll continue to make over the next five years are to enable entrepreneurs to come up with better data sets, cleaner, more systematic data sets, so that you could actually start to use the better tools for that. Uh, on the creating therapeutics, um, I, I, they're actually the data sets are are much more systematic and better. I mean, pharma companies collect lots of data um, in different formats. Um, academia has been generating data for a long time. Now those data sets are getting more harmonized and bigger because of you know genome sequencing and other approaches. And there you actually could use algorithms and machine learning and, and advanced approaches to actually find insights and recognize patterns you otherwise wouldn't have and speed the discovery of new therapeutics. So, for us, I think in the, on the former, it's more data. On the second part, it's more algorithms and analytics. Um, but I, I, I agree with Krishna's point. The, the former challenge is a big one, and I think just helping entrepreneurs build businesses where they can generate very consistent data sets is um, something we should all be working on. So I'll talk about <clears throat> two different um, areas for me, because sitting where I sit within a health system, you know, we have the luxury of, we're deploying things right now clinically. We're deploying right now things right now operationally. So we can sit and look and see what breaks through. You know, what are those things that are really adopted, are really solving critical problems, and then focus on those and taking them out, spinning them out into uh, solutions for other institutions that look like us. So that's, that's one area. The second area that I'd look at is it doesn't look like an AI investment. It'll look like a therapeutics investment. But as AI continues to penetrate into the academic labs and the, um, make our researchers even smarter about developing you know, even better technologies, even more interesting therapeutics, um, then we will be investing in the output of those labs. So while on the surface it won't look like an AI investment per se, it really has been en enabled by AI in that early discovery phase. 
Thanks. So, Roger, I'd actually like to pick up on that point, and I'm going to pivot that over, Mike, to you, because I think while um, you know Roger sits in a unique uh, ecosystem within partners where there's also access to a significant amount of data and looking for breakthroughs, so does Amgen. And you guys have deployed capital as well as efforts, as we were discussing before this, in multiple ways, both through your venture firm as well as also internal to your organization. And I imagine a lot of that is also data-driven. So I'm curious if you could speak to sort of how you think about that, how you think your data sets align within Amgen, and then also how you think about that from an investment perspective across that. So yeah, that's right. We have both uh, a significant internal effort to use these technologies and allow them um, to get out to patients and help, and, and also uh, make venture investments. And data is the key. I, you know, uh, uh, as Krishna said. Um, you know, access to the right data sets is the first question. We do have a lot of internal data, but we end up, like everybody else, going out and tapping the data sets that are out there, large EMR data sets and others. We believe that we have the best genetics in the world. We use that data set heavily. Uh, and it always starts there, because if you don't have the right data, the techniques don't work very well. Um, but if we do identify a use case, that's the other challenge. Do you have the right use case, the right thing you're trying to solve, because we stumble there often, and then you can find the right data set. Actually, after that, it's kind of sledding downhill until you get to the part where you have a solution and you want to scale it, and then you have to have people change how they work. Then it gets really hard again. Um, but look, we use both techniques. We work with externals. We have also had success hiring very young, bright people and turning them loose on the kinds of tools that Google creates and makes easy for everybody to use. And we've developed predictive models for uh, predicting when a bone's going to break out of uh, out of data sets that we and others have, and we did that internally, and we've developed predictive models for when people are going to have, say, another event after a previous cardiac event, and we've done that with external companies. And so we'll deploy all the different levers to try to make that happen. And ultimately, though, that does have to be an investment thesis. So what's the investment thesis behind making a decision about actually putting money to work, whether it's in a new a company or within your organization? So we have a two-stage. The first stage is actually, uh, we don't even have a business case. We just, is it a good idea? because we're going to deploy very small amounts of capital. It's a few hundred thousand dollars to try something. Um, and sometimes that drives our partners crazy because they want a bigger commitment. But we'll try something at pilot scale. And honestly, all I ask for is a single page and does it make sense and do the people who know something about it think there's a there there and we'll deploy that. When we get to the next stage, what we're going to scale, then yeah, I mean, you really have to ask, does it solve the problem, a problem that we care about? What are the projections? And interestingly, the AI kinds of recedes into the back at that point. It's not about the AI. It's about, you know, did we get a good enough data on the first go that we really believe this will scale? Do we have the ability to scale it? All those, all those very basic kind of things. And those business cases don't look wildly different than the business cases for just like we're going to make any other internal change to the company. Yeah, interesting. So um, Amir, I want to pick it up and throw it over to you. So we, you also were talking about the value of data and sort of making sure there's clean and part of that as being one of the things you need to see your entrepreneurs uh, do and have in hand. How do you also square that with the way that you're thinking about an investment thesis that actually makes you convert actually all the way over to wanting to deploy capital around that? Are there additional pieces of the strategy process or framework that you need beyond that? And how does Polaris approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think our, our general approach tends to be that, you know, as we tell our limited partners, you know, we're investing in technologies or approaches that make people's lives better. And I think that there are moments where people get excited about uh, a, a buzzword or a concept, and and that can drive a whole bunch of investing thesis. But we've tried very hard to identify entrepreneurs who just want to create better products for the patients or the caregivers or even the insurance companies or whatnot so that you can just accelerate the pace at which someone's health gets better and you do it in a way that creates either increased productivity so the person goes back to work, there's more money, or you save costs or a combination of both. And, and I think that um, when you take that filter, what you find is that entrepreneurs come in with the solutions that to the problem that's right at hand. So right now, the, many of the entrepreneurs we're finding on the delivery, healthcare delivery and non-therapeutic side, um, they're coming in with a pretty crisp value proposition around you know, this particular business model works for the customer and the consequence of that is because it's profitable, we're gonna continue to do more and more of it and we're gonna generate better data. And 
And I think the machine learning part where new insights, et cetera, come about kind of follows in, in those types of businesses. Um, and, and it's kind of a, more of a futuristic part of it. Uh, maybe it's on the roadmap a year, two years, three years from now once the data sets get good. But I think the good entrepreneurs appreciate that in like kind of general delivery of service, et cetera, it's kind of hard to use machine learning. On the other hand, we've invested in diagnostics companies and therapeutics discovery companies where the entrepreneurs come in and they've already got you know pretty standardized data set or, um, or the industry has a standardized data set and you can use advanced tools to come up with a, a, a discovery or a therapeutic or a diagnostic much faster or better than any other approach. Um, and I think, we, and, and that just makes sense and you look at the data. And so I think there is an investment thesis today, but it just has to be pointed at how quickly can you get to the solution that the patient is looking for, the doctor is looking for, the system is looking for, um, rather than kind of the buzzword. Because I think there's a lot of buzzwords that are thrown around and, and they can be pretty distracting actually um, sometimes. And, and, and to Krishna's point, they send you down a path where you actually find the wrong thing out, <laughs> where you find out something that's not true uh, because you know bad data in, bad results out, so. Yeah, so um, Adam, uh, Bain in the life sciences sector is, is a newer uh, mover in the marketplace and, and building a portfolio and a track record. I'm curious how, as you guys have both formed the team and then started to deploy investments, how you're thinking about this as a space and what you're looking for for key drivers to, to sort of start to build to the investment thesis that maybe you know, Mike has pretty instantiated actually at Amgen. Yeah, we talk about this a lot, actually, because these, these, I mean, you mentioned buzzwords, and there's, there's, there is a certain amount of hype in buzzwords, and lots of companies come in and talk about big data. Uh, one of the driving elements of our uh, investment process is to have a very defined, crisp investment thesis. We're putting capital to work. We want to understand where is that capital going? How long will it take to achieve the purpose in which the management said they were putting it to work? And what is the de-risking event? And when will it happen? One of the things we like to avoid, though, with, with kind of hypes and big words and big data is um, undefined experiments, is to say, well, we're just going to capture data. <laughs> and we're gonna see where it leads us. Uh, I learned something from the FDA and from biostatisticians once, which is you know, if you look at a lot of data and a lot of retrospective subgroup analyses, you are going to find p-values, and those p-values <laughs> are likely gonna lead you down the wrong path, and then you're gonna spend a lot of capital uh, you know, trying to validate something that probably isn't true. The problem with getting a lot of big data when it's not hypothesis driven, when it's not prospectively being used for particular purposes, it likely will lead you astray. So big data can be as dangerous as it is helpful. So when we are talking to companies that talk about big data, we always ask them, what is the data you are capturing? For what purpose? And what is it you're hoping it will allow you to do in the future? At this point for us, we are looking for specific projects. We are looking for specific value creation events. So I'd say we are less interested in the overall big concept of big data, but we are extremely interested and we are attracted to um, companies and management teams that say they want to leverage big data for a particular purpose where they already have a hypothesis and a clear way of moving forward. And look, the last point I want to make on, on this line of thinking is, you know, we have seen this movie play before a little bit and that, that was with the genomic revolution back around 2000, 2001, where, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of very positive statements in 2000, which is, you know, we have the human genome, uh, it's all about genomics now and in two or three years we're going to solve all of medicine and of course that didn't happen and, and companies that went out to try to, to say we are genomics companies and we're just going to make a ton of drugs, like they didn't really make drugs that much faster than anybody else did. Um, but if you now look 20 years later and you look back and you look and say, okay, what has happened? What have the advances been in a lot of drugs and therapies? You say, we have leveraged genomics incredibly, and we couldn't have done anything, a very, very small percentage of what we as a community have accomplished without genomics. But it was more about using genomics as a tool in a very thoughtful, focused, prospective way that led to the development of a lot of really helpful therapies. It, it wasn't this kind of big idea like, we're gonna, we're gonna own all of genomics and we're gonna do things much faster than anybody else ever has. Yeah. So that's what we look for in our investment thesis with, with AI. So that's interesting. So you pick up a little bit on something that um, Jim alluded to earlier in his first comment, which was uh, actually in sort of where the trends are and the buzzwords, and then where there's actually real value. And so Jim, I'm wondering if you could spend a little bit more time, because we talked about this a little bit before the panel as well, in the way that Goldman and the way that you are thinking about the sectors that you cover and where you see their real being actual 
realizable value at this moment versus uh, longer term, as well as also where you see those investment dollars going and the trends. Sure. So uh, I'll be. I'll be relatively general, um, which I'm an investment banker is kind of what I embedded <laughs> in the DNA. Um, you know, healthcare. I'll, I'll focus the the, the the comments on healthcare technology just as a subsector and market. We can get more specific on artificial intelligence. Um, healthcare, healthcare technology for the better part of the last decade has been a challenging in market to navigate, especially from public investors. I think for private investors as well. Um, uh, you know, I, I think one of the bigger challenges has been and continues to be the notion of building one and selling to many in a in a traditional information technology, software technology enabled services uh, standpoint. Um, and that that seems to be somewhat or at least the degree of that somewhat unique to the healthcare end market, to the fact that you know, not-for-profit health systems are all in somewhat different places. Insurance companies through decades of M&A are in different, in, in different places from a systems orientation standpoint. And so we've just seen this time and time again as companies mature, um, they, 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 at a certain scale, uh, find it harder to grow. Um, I, now, what I do believe is uh, as artificial intelligence algorithms mature, and get more broadly adopted, um, you know, th there is an ability to unlock that uh, build one, sell to many um, uh, business model scalability issue that's been a challenge in the past. And, and, and that, I think the root of it is, you know, AI can certainly help on the labor arbitrage. And, and the key, as I'm sure every panelist talked about here um, uh, yesterday and today, on, on lowering healthcare costs over the long term is to, to, to you know, pull frankly some of the, the labor intensity out of things, um, both on the care and the healthcare delivery side, but just on the administration of healthcare itself. Um, and so that's a place where we're focused on and like to see business models that can do that, especially as we think about um, IPO ability of those businesses. No, that's great, and we'll pick up on the IPO piece a little later. So um, uh, this is a question from the audience, um, Roger. I'm going to I'm going to give this one to you because <laughs> the first word is academic. Um, academic spinouts uh, born out of the healthcare system sometimes struggle to generalize to other healthcare systems. And so in your view, what are some of the key differentiators for companies or approaches that translate well from organization to organization and those that don't? Sure, so it's true that they don't always uh, translate. And you know, the first thing you have to figure out is, are you solving a problem that's unique to your healthcare system? Or are you solving a problem for healthcare? Um, because it's not uncommon where we are a little idiosyncratic and we may think that everybody is like us and therefore if this solution has value for us, it will have value for everyone. Um, and you know, that we can look at that within a partner's healthcare where we can look at an academic medical center and the needs of an academic medical center, but also a community hospital. And their needs are not always the same. And there are a lot more community hospitals than there are academic medical centers if you're trying to uh, figure out what the market size is. So really understanding from a diligence perspective all the different dimensions. Um, one is, you know, is this an academic medical center issue or is it a healthcare issue? Is it just your organization or is it really um, very broad? Um, and, and, you know, those are those are important things to think about as we do this. And you know, another area that we focus on is it's quite common for us within our institution for somebody to come in and say, I've got this great idea, everybody needs it, and um, you need to invest in it. And we say, okay, who within Partners Healthcare is willing to pay you for this? Well, nobody's willing to pay for it, but we think there's a huge market for it. And we say, like, okay, I think the fact that nobody within your own institution is willing to pay for this should be the first indicator that maybe the market is not as, doesn't need this as much as you think they do. And so, you know, there's a whole, diff a whole host of different internal diligence items that you can use. Yeah, thanks. So, um Krishna, I would expect that a significant portion of the audience here and the attendees of the conference are entrepreneurs who are thinking about both the tech space and the healthcare space. And if I was one of them and I was looking at this panel, you know, full disclosure, you'd probably be the person I would be standing up to talk to at the end of this. And so I'm curious for you to talk a that, little bit. That would bit. be their first mistake. Yeah. <laughs> well, People actually that's a, that, have exactly. some customers so, here. Right. And <laughs> Perfect. So I'm curious uh, for you to talk a little bit about how Google approaches really uh, sort 
sort of a hybrid space where you have a company that has a huge affiliation and sort of synonymous with tech, but you just by way of your background as well as also the way that you're making investments really look a lot more like you're doing a lot of therapeutic focus, uh, obviously do other things beside that. So I'm just curious for you to comment on the way that you think Google fits within this framework and space. You know, um, so we started Google Ventures back in 2008, 2009, and um, you know when we started and we were thinking for, first, the first thought we had was, uh, let's stay away from therapeutics. It's too risky. Uh, you know, these companies just like implode and they go from hundreds of millions of dollars into zero. That would seem like a bad way to start. Uh, so, so we kind of avoided it for a bit. Um, and then, and then we said, well, okay, like you know, machine learning, big data. There should be a way to kind of apply that to drug discovery. And I think, um, along with every other tech person in the world, we said, well, like we can take these large amounts of genomic data and other, you know, publication data, and we can help pharma come up with targets. And they're going to pay for targets. And it turns out uh, they don't want to pay for targets. <laughs> They'll pay you a dollar for a target, something like that. Um, and and it took us a while to figure out. Uh, I mean, just to the points uh, I think everybody here has been making, that you know, your customer has a thing that they want to transact around, and you have to provide that thing, not something that's several steps before that thing. So pharma is not interested in targets. They're interested in the drug, um, uh, or, or something that's going to meaningfully move uh, uh, the, the ship towards, uh, towards that end, end uh, destination. Um, so you know, I, think, I think Amir made the point, and, and uh, and I think everybody here has made that point. You know, first step is think about what what your customer wants and and where you're going. It is occasionally the case, is very rarely the case that um, you know you're going to kind of go and define some completely new market. Uh, you know, it's it's the old adage of um, you know if 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 Henry Ford had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. You know, so people sometimes say, okay, I'm just going to come up with this new thing. And it's just if you're thinking that way, you have to just you know just keep you know, doubting whether you're actually right about that, because most of the time, you'll be wrong about it. Um, on the other hand, if you're, uh, and that would be kind of a contrarian perspective, I think all of us as investors are looking for those sorts of contrarian opportunities. Um, but most of the time, uh, the answer is that, you know, even, in, even in those situations, there's some customer who's asking for a thing, and you have to go the full way to actually meet them uh, where they're at. In terms of companies that then do that at this intersection of you know technology and and healthcare, um, as a group that you know our, our venture fund is made up, our, especially on the healthcare side, is all pretty much MDs, PhDs, MD PhDs, um, usually with some computational background uh, or, or statistics sort of background. Um, you know, for us, I think uh, the world probably looks at us as Google Ventures and thinks about us as thinking about the world more in a tech perspective. And I think we absolutely want to bring that and bring the whole rest of the infrastructure of Google along to the extent that it's helpful for companies. Um, but we spend a huge amount of time uh, just getting schooled by the complexity of nature, the complexity of our health system, the complexity of the regulatory environment. And I think it takes just a tremendous amount of humility. Uh, a lot of us continue to practice partially because uh, patients also school us in humility and, and the number of uh, ways that we can uh, uh, do this wrong um, and, and kind of the amount of focus and energy it takes to, to kind of even, even get to the starting line. And if you can take that humility, that complexity uh, that we're all kind of operating in and then find the targeted areas where all the stuff that's happening in the technology universe can organically fit in, uh, you know, I think that's, that's magic. Uh, organizationally, that tends to look like usually two different types of communities uh, that somehow get married and, and, and kind of work and have tension, but uh, productive tension inside of an organization. We've, we've held any number of events where we brought people from the, the healthcare universe together with people from the tech universe, uh, sat people at the same table, and then realized that they're just not even talking to each other. Uh, you know, so, so there has to be somebody who's kind of in between and translating, um, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, I think that's that's kind of what we spend almost all of our time, in, especially in the companies that we're we're forming, uh, or companies that we get brought into, where there's a goal of, of of that sort of interaction. That that's where we spend almost all of our time is is trying to find a way to marry those. You can even see it deep in the guts of the company as to how does compensation work. Hmm. Uh, you know, do you do you comp your tech people the same way as your laboratory people? It's like <laughs> it's that's all kind of um, not sexy, but but that's kind of where. Um, you know, where, where I think these things actually happen. I'm sure we all kind of 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll insert the, uh, do you uh, cast a pre-money at a tech uh, pre-money or a healthcare pre-money? Okay. Well? Nowadays, they're, they're more similar <laughs> <laughs> than they used so, to be, so. <laughs> thanks. So Amir, um, you know, Polaris is an interesting group because they have really maintained sort of a dual identity both in healthcare and technology. Um, and while most people really, when they look at venture funds, think that, you know, we are the folks that are sitting in front of this huge pile of money and writing checks, which is absolutely the case, we also have an LP base that we need to raise money from as well in order to keep continue to do that. So I'm curious, as you have both maintained that identity and really built out a really interesting portfolio um, in this space where you see a lot of hybrid companies, how do you talk to your LPs about, uh, about AI, about te tech, um, and sort of where that overlap is between them? Yeah, I think, um, I think these days, as they are, our LPs understand that these two worlds are kind of crashing into each other. I think, so they understand the overall theme and they understand the benefits that could come. Well, they presume there must be benefits from it because we're all doing it and all their other investor investments and other general partners are also doing it, so they must assume something good's coming out of it. I th the way we describe it to them, and, and I apologize for consistently making this kind of dichotomy, but we kind of tell them there's, there's basically two opportunities here. The first is, Taking a step back, I'm about to step into areas I know less than I should about. But you know, my understanding, and, and Krishna can correct me, that that machine learning, the algorithms that machine learning, and we now call it AI, are really built on. Um, if we use that term very specifically and consistently, it is quite different than the way in which you would normally analyze data, and and it does allow for certain things to happen that couldn't have that were harder to do before. And the, to me, they fall into two categories as I see it. And actually, the alpha. Go is actually an alpha zero, pretty two, two good examples. The first is you recognize patterns. You have this incredible ability to recognize patterns that you otherwise would have missed. And, and you know, brain's pretty good at that, but you, know, you can now really supercharge it if you've got a consistent data set um, that you can play against. So kind of the cat versus the guitar. But I think that, in that, and so what we tell our LPs is in a huge part of the healthcare system, the real problem is recognizing a pattern, you know, that a patient should get a particular therapy. They're sick before they, before they present. If we can identify disease, if we can identify therapy, if we can identify the better decisions that should be made, that's a huge part of the healthcare system and probably over half of it. And there's a lot of bad decisions that are made. So if you can improve the ability to make decisions, I think machine learning could really benefit. And that's, I think, a huge bunch of opportunity. The other part, which is, is staggering, is the ability of these new algorithms, if done right, and, and Google really did this with AlphaZero, is to actually come up with solutions that you otherwise would not have come up with. And a good example is when, in this big Go game they were playing, there were certain maneuvers that everybody thought were really bad ideas that, that AlphaZero, AlphaGo was making. And I think it gave Google and others insights into when you process the data with these algorithms, you can actually come up with totally new inventions. And I think the role of machine learning algorithms in the inventive process is interesting also. And that I, that I kind of bifurcate more towards discovering new therapies or new approaches. We do have some portfolio companies that, are, that have actually used these algorithms for that, for that purpose. And, and, and you know it's baby steps right now, but I think that is going to be another really big opportunity as you start to think about the huge number of inventive experiments you could do in discovery that are much larger than what you could do with a team of chemists or you know you know humans. And I think marrying human intuition and human you know abilities on top of that capability set is going to get us to really great heights for discovery. So that's how we describe it to our LPs, and we always say, look, at the end of the day, our job is to create better healthcare outcomes, and that's really where this machine learning is taking us in two different directions. Now, I'm gonna, you know, Krishna should like disagree with all that, because this is like Google's wheelhouse, um, and I'm just kind of, in, you know, talking no, about things like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Okay>, great. <laughs> there, there is something uh, in that. I mean, I think um, uh, it's an interesting distinction between AlphaGo and AlphaZero, uh, where, you know, in, in Zero, it's kind of like, you know, the approach was not to teach, not, not to do what we did in chess and checkers and like all these other games where it's like you, you basically, um, you know, train off of a huge number of games and you have a computer that can then play at the level of a human that surpass a human. You know, what was profound about uh, Zero was that uh, you actually teach the computer the rules of Go and then just have it play itself for a while to determine strategy. So it, you know, it did that for a few hours and then was able to uh, beat humans in creative new ways that nobody had ever thought of before. 
And if you think about that for a second, it's kind of like, um, then the important, one of the important things there is like, well, what are the rules? What are the rules of the game? Like, and there's certain areas like uh, you know, clinical medicine where it's not clear what the rules are, um, but there's other areas like medicinal chemistry, for instance, where, where maybe we can infer some rules, but as any medicinal chemist here would, would tell you is like, we don't know all the rules. So I, I think that's, that's one of the complicated parts of it is um, you know, in certain areas we know the rules and we can kind of uh, do profoundly exciting things right now. Uh, you know, and, and then there's other areas where we know some of the rules and maybe we can do very interesting new things. Um, and then there's other areas where it's like, nobody's even talked about what rules are in this environment. Um, and we probably uh, will need humans for a long time to come, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> exactly. Investing. Yeah. Investing. Yeah. The other thing I would, I would add is that you know, on the data side, obviously we have a lot more data than we've ever had before, but we don't have that much data. Um, if you think about in the path of, a, you know, think about your own experience, how often you interact with a provider where you provide di data to that provider um, versus, you know, other uh, data sets that people are working on, you know, it's, it's actually not that much. You know, you can think about people in a clinical trial, maybe that's the, the best data sets that we'll see. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the interesting things that's come along and that's coming along is different ways to collect um, a, a lot more data on individual patients. And it's going to be interesting to see there you've got data sets that are so large you almost have to have AI to sort through them, um, you know, how that's going to impact you know, clinical medicine. Anyone else want to comment on that? I just think it keeps coming back to what we keep saying over and over is you better pick your use case very carefully and you better have the right data to bring to it. It's less that you have the world's greatest AI researchers because Google already hired them and if they didn't, Facebook <laughs> did. Um, it's more, because the companies we see that are struggling, they're struggling with one of those two things, right? They don't understand exactly what they're trying to do. And then you can morph, right? It's not like you're, you're locked in, but if you have a crisp thesis, it's just so much easier than we've got a lot of data and we have some cool tools and it certainly has to help somewhere. Yeah. Um, that's just a hard way to go. No, I agree with that, and, and Christian, you said something that resonated with me, and, and you brought it up as well about knowing what your use case is and knowing what the problem is, which is this kind of East Coast versus West Coast investing mentality. Uh, I don't want to say it that way. Could this be kind of healthcare investing mentality versus tech investing mentality? But there's this concept that you can just brute force a problem and that let's just put money against it. Let's just get as much information as we can. Let's get really smart people, and we're going to solve the problem. But you, know, you, you both said something, which is we don't know what the rules are, right? The human body is so complicated, and then take the human body in a diseased state, uh, it's even more complicated. And so, and chemistry is infinite. And, it's, it's, and, and then the third piece, so the human body is, is, is much more complicated than any other problem we've solved. Chemistry is infinite, and biology can't be brute forced, right? I think we've proven over and over again that biology has to be done one step at a time, and you need biologists, and you need to run the experiments. And so, I, and I do think one of the issues in this space from an investing perspective is, is as you have these two types of investors that kind of come together uh, at times and want to collaborate, they're not speaking the same language, they have different experiences, they have different interpretation of what risk is to them, and how much information they need before they are comfortable making an investment. And I've seen this tangibly over and over again. The two groups of investors do not generally play well together in the same investments. They have different, and one of the biggest issues is they have different expectations on value and, and how much capital they're willing to put towards a problem before they see any tangible result out. And I actually think this is a pitfall that's really important for this community right here to really first see if you agree with it and then try to see how we're gonna manage it going forward because it is gonna take risk capital both from the healthcare world and from the technology world. And right now, I just don't think that the language is, is, is we're, not, we're, not, we're not speaking the same way, and I think we're having some issues. So Adam, that's a great point, and actually is a great tee up to the question I was going to direct at you next anyway, so I'll come back to you, um, which is to say, that's there. great. We can think about technology, we can think about how investors should work with each other, we can think about what that product looks like. How do you actually also then reduce that down into team? Because I think you described a challenge at both an investor at capital 
and risk and return ratio r level, as well as a value level, but you also have to have a team that can execute on that. So how is Bain, as you're evolving your thesis in this space, also thinking about what the team you want to actually deliver on that is? I'll ask you to start, and then if other people want to join in and comment on that, please do. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked it that way, because our investing style is we, we look at team first, right? A great team can take questionable assets and make value out of them, and a bad team can destroy good assets, right? So it's always, it's always about people and team first. Um, and I think that uh, we do, I, I would imagine that healthcare investors also have a different perspective on what they're looking for in a team than technology investors. And I'd imagine that the, the teams need to have respect for the complexity of the problem that they're trying to solve. So they, the, you do need a certain amount of hubris, you do need a certain amount of, of, um, of what's the best way to say it? like willingness to take risk, but you also have to have respect for the complexity of the problem that you're facing and the steps it's gonna take in between each capital raise and how much money you're willing to risk at each step. And I think we do look for teams that have that humility, that recognize what it is that they don't know and are willing to go a step at a time. Uh, and one of the lines I use with my team and I've used with management teams is, you know, it's really hard to build the encyclopedia use the encyclopedia while you're trying to write the encyclopedia. And I've oftentimes seen teams that are trying to do all three things at the same time, and it's just too complicated, and, and it, 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 can, it can lead to problematic outcomes. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah can I make a comment on that? I, I actually think, um, I believe someone told me this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but that someone had asked Hawking's, you know, what Stephen Hawking's, what, the def, what he thought was intelligence, he'd said adaptability. And I, and I do think great teams have, both on the tech and the, and the healthcare, biotech, let's say, those two extremes, have, you know, great teams are very adaptable because, every, you know, things go wrong. But I think that in healthcare, what I've noticed, because we have invested in teams that are more, what, you would, what you'd call maybe more West Coast or whatnot, that are come out of a pure tech um, consumer background or, you know, fast, you know, the kind of Silicon Valley type, you know, approach. And what I've noticed is that uh, the, the difference between the two areas is that in health, when healthcare is regulated, so you can't innovate in series in a sense because it takes you a long time. You know, once you make a decision, you're somewhat committed to that decision for some period of time. And because that's just the product by its definition, if you want to go back and fix something, there's a bunch of people you have to tell that you're trying to fix you know, this thing and it just goes slower. Whereas I think on the, on the non-regulated, non-healthcare side, it's much faster to change things. You know, if your app isn't working or if you do a user, you know, if you don't like this color, like that color, you can change quickly. And, and I think, therefore, healthcare teams tend to think a lot more about all the possible things that could go wrong and, and all the options because they don't get to real world test 18 different versions of something before you know, they figure out what's the right, what's the exactly right mix because that would take too long. Um, and I think that that, is the fundamental, I've noticed the difference, that both teams are actually thinking about everything that could go wrong and, and they're worried about it, but the experiences that they come from, one group is very conservative because they're so, they realize that the feedback system loop is so slow and they're gonna run out of money before they try 18 versions, and so they try to kind of do it in their heads as much as possible, whereas the, the group that has traditionally worked in non-regulated, non-healthcare industries, you know, they, they can rapidly innovate real time with our customers and they can get feedback and change the app and move the button and do that. You know, FDA doesn't let us do a lot of those things. Um, and, I, and so I, I think they're both trying to do the same thing. It's just the approach is different and bringing that up, you know, out in the open and talking about that, we have found in one of our companies to be very helpful because it's allowed people to frame the problem and say, okay, we are trying to do the same thing. Our experience has led us to two different solutions. What's the right solution for this particular, you know, opportunity? I might, um, you know, might put a, a different, as, 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 as Google Ventures, uh, you know, where our capital base is largely in the West Coast, uh, but I'm operating here in the East Coast, we kind of live and we invest heavily in the tech ecosystem, and we're investing in all those companies on the tech side that I think we'd all look at and say, well, that, that's crazy. Um, and there's a lot of them have gone really well. And, and, and when I take a step back as to like, well, wh is there an East Coast, West Coast sort of dynamic? Maybe there is. Um, uh, but I might, I might put it, offer a different framework. Um, and I might say, you know, in, in, you know why, is, why is that sort of growth and that sort of risk taking and that sort of approach to investing possible uh, in the technology sector? And I'd say that, you know, if we dialed the clock back to the 1960s, uh, 1970s, looked at the days of like Arthur Rock and like, you know, kind of, you know, 
the, the many generations ago uh, of, uh, of venture capitalists, you know, they'd probably look a lot more like what we're talking about in the healthcare sector because the cost was so high just to start. Um, you know, in the intervening time, there's been platforms that have been developed in the technology universe that have dramatically reduced the cost of trying something. You know, so, so why does Google exist? Why does, uh, you know, why does Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, like why could these things grow the way they did? Um, and, and part of it is there's these whole infrastructures that have appeared in the intervening time, Ethernet, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the internet as a, as a whole, cloud computing, uh, you know, machine learning offered as a service, these sorts of things um, make it a lot easier for the, you know, and the next, the, the current entrepreneur to try a whole bunch of things. And, you know, there was this moment in, you know, 2004, 2005, where you kind of look at it and you say, from a tech perspective, I can try something that now looks like a whole company for a few hundred thousand dollars, whereas just 10 years ago, you might have had to raise 10 million, 20 million dollars to start. And I'd, I'd offer that in the healthcare world, we are, we are still quite far away from, from seeing those platforms and that, that infrastructure exist. And so for us, we're kind of looking at it and saying, well, yeah, to try something is going to be very expensive. And that's where I'd go back to the, the earlier statement that you know, I think, I think if, if, if I were to look to where should we be placing, or where would I be placing dollars over the next five uh, plus years, it's about building that infrastructure. It's like, what's our version uh, you know, of, um, you know, of the financial rails that connect the country? It's going to be more complicated here. It's a more complicated problem. Uh, and it's going to cost billions of dollars to, to create, most likely. Um, but on the other end of doing that, we will be able to ask questions and try things for far less for far less money, and then we'll be able to look uh, at, at you know, opportunities that would have previously seemed um, inaccessible and try them uh, for far less capital and take different sorts of risks. And I'd, I'd point out uh, you know, to one of Adam's uh, uh, points, it's like you, know, you kind of look at the days of genomics uh, from the 2000s and all the promise there, and then you know, kind of the, the, the hype cycle that kind of uh, was created on that. But it's kind of like a point in the, in the broader biology ecosystem and all the complexity. It's, it, it is an area where there's a little bit more organization, where there's been a little bit more work around platforms and we've been able to access and, and think about uh, uh, taking risk and starting different types of companies in that ecosystem than maybe you know, in others and you can kind of see how it influences other parts of the ecosystem. But you know, just, to, just to kind of take a step back to that, it's like you know, maybe the case that you know, maybe it's not East Coast, West Coast, maybe it's just, you know, different industries are at different stages of integrating information technology and benefiting um, from the revolution that we've seen already happen in communications and fintech and advertising and all these other areas. We just haven't fully seen that take place in healthcare. It's gonna come. And then when we kind of sit back on the stage 10 years from now or something, we're gonna look at it and be like, yeah, now people are doing all sorts of crazy investing. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then, you know, who knows what the West Coast is going to be doing then. <laughs> Great. So um, I know we're pushed up against time, but I feel like I would be remiss with, uh, if we didn't actually have a VC panel that talked uh, about one of the most important things for us, which is exits. So we've touched on data, we've touched on team, we've touched on technology, we've touched on investors, we've touched on uh, East Coast, West Coast. But I'd like to actually uh, end this with thinking about how do we think about exits. And um, Jim, I'm going to put it to you first, because you cover public companies. I'd like you to comment about the IPO market. And then if other folks have other views on that, that's great. Um, otherwise, I think just based on sort of the interest of time, we probably need to, to wrap soon. So Jim, yep. no pressure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, could you sum up I'll exits quick. uh, really quickly uh, across all uh, sure. AI and uh, healthcare investments? Uh, Thanks. I'll be quick. I don't <laughs> hear that. Chris's bad side. I can, yeah. I can see him standing there. Um, look, I think on the, uh, there's never been more interest, I think, from the tradition, uh, from the tech side and what's going on in healthcare. So from an M&A standpoint, um, I do think that you will see that interest manifest itself into more M&A activity. In the healthcare, in the healthcare world, we have there, there's been significant consolidation at the upper end of the market. 85% of the healthcare services market caps captured by 10 companies today. Uh, those companies are going through a lot of integration challenges, reimbursement. There's lots of question on what happens 2020. Um, I actually think that you won't see as much out of that market. And then from an IPO standpoint, it's been it's really been a, uh, you know, nothing has really happened over the last couple of years in the traditional healthcare technology sense. That's going to change. You'll see much more than nothing happen over the course of the next 12 <laughs> months. And my hope is that will beget more and more companies looking at the IPO alternative as a, as a good exit and, and bringing some, all these investments to, to, to public investors. Great. Anyone else have a comment, final comment or closing? 
Oh, okay. Well, thank you all. This was a terrific panel and commentary. Thank you. Thanks to all yeah. for their questions. Thanks, nice